Coming to you from Beaumont, this is your house call. We're eight months into the COVID-19 pandemic, and we've adjusted to masking and social distancing and hand washing. Many of us have transitioned to social gatherings outside, eating outside, embracing nature. But as the autumn leaves fall, we know the inevitable is coming, winter. Winter weather makes the pandemic life a little bit more difficult to escape. The cold reality is that we should plan for how to survive COVID-19 this winter. And you're about to find out how. Hello and welcome to the Beaumont House Call podcast. I'm Dr. Asha Shahjahan. Our goal is to help you and your family live smarter and healthier lives. Today we'll be talking about how to survive COVID-19 this winter. Joining us today is Dr. Karen Weaver, a primary care physician and program director of Family Medicine Residency Program at Beaumont Wayne. Dr. Weaver, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. And I'm super excited that I'm talking to you because I feel like we are kindred spirits. Like we both have, you know, we're both family physicians. Uh, We both kind of have this um, passion for teaching future doctors. And then I also feel like you, you have this big heart for vulnerable populations, which I just adore. So thank you so much for being here. We are kind of talking about a little bit of a depressing topic, (laughs) but I think it's important. So in general, how have you been personally during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think for myself and for everyone, on one hand, it's been a bit isolating. Mm -hmm. We're isolated from a lot of our friends um, and sometimes as a physician to our families. And then on the other hand, we have more family time with our kids or our spouses or our uh, very close relatives. So I think it's um, it's the best of times, the worst of times yeah. um, in some ways. And we have to figure out how to get through the next few months uh, as healthy as we can and keep everyone safe around us. Absolutely. And you're mentioning, you know, as a physician, there is some extra challenges in terms of you know having to stay away from your family to keep them safe, especially if you're working the front lines. What have you been seeing in your clinical practice uh, since COVID has hit? And I'm not just talking about positive COVID cases or symptoms of COVID. Like, what are the other things that you're seeing? Because in my practice, I've been seeing a lot of anxiety and depression. I think we have been seeing a lot of anxiety and depression. And while some people are not able to really express what they're feeling and that is directly related to COVID, Mm -hmm. they are definitely having new symptoms that they haven't experienced before, either worry or anger or irritability or or tiredness, sleeping too much. A lot of people ate too much Mm -hmm. um, over the COVID because of what food was available, but I also think for comfort reasons. The COVID-15, 15 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. I called it the COVID-19. Oh, Uh, (laughs) okay. 19 pounds. Okay. So, So what do you tell your patients when they present to you that way? Well, we talk about everything that might be going on in their life and whether it's a connection with family or a connection to COVID if they know people who've been sick, if they've lost people. What I've noticed is there's this fear factor that exists in some people and others, there's the opposite. And I've had patients come and tell me, hey, there's this gathering going on for a birthday party and it's almost like a a pressure. I feel this pressure from my family that I should attend but I have diabetes, I have COPD, or I'm asthmatic, and I don't feel comfortable going, but my family's offended. So in that type of situation, what advice would you give patients? Well, I think that there are ways to celebrate those things separately or virtually, or if you really feel like you need to make an appearance Do it wearing a mask, staying in the back, staying for a shorter period of time. Um, But also just reassuring patients that it's okay if their choice is to not be part of that celebration Mm -hmm. because they're afraid of their own health or those around them and that those family connections will still be there after COVID. 
I'm thinking now, I mean, you and I are here in this bright room and we do have windows in the room and we can see all the beautiful fall colors, but the sky is kind of overcast. Um, and it's a little cold and I think winter is coming and that is scaring a lot of people because we have heard of seasonal affective disorder and many people suffer from that during the, this season. What are your concerns about COVID-19 compounding seasonal affective disorder? Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. And so for people who don't know what seasonal affective disorder is, it's there are some people who definitely have some depressive symptoms during certain seasons, and at least um, two seasons is how we would diagnose it. And it's related to the weather. It's mostly in the winter because there's not as much sunlight. We're not outside. The days are shorter. Um, and then we also have this concomitant virus that uh, is causing health problems for a lot of people. A lot of people have died. Um, we're coming into a flu season that people are also worried about. Um, there are a lot of people that already have some anxiety and depression over COVID. And that combination could certainly uh, cause significant uh, stress and increase someone's anxiety or depression. So let's talk about what actually happens in seasonal affective disorder. So you said there's a, a decrease in sunlight, and that can actually disrupt your internal clock, which is your circadian rhythm. And we talked also about the fact that when you have lower sunlight, you also have reduced levels of serotonin. So this directly affects a decrease in mood. And then also melatonin levels are actually disrupted as well. So sunlight is actually a huge part of wellness. And um, vitamin D is also synthesized through right. sunlight. So what are your thoughts about taking vitamin D supplements um, for the general public? Should people have their vitamin D level checked? Um, and what dosages do you recommend if you do recommend any? So I actually don't recommend vitamin D testing. Okay. Uh, and that's because I think that most people in Michigan are going to be vitamin D deficient so in, in the winter. In the northeastern states or in right. the states that are like further away from the equator. Uh, agreed. Okay. Yeah. There's not much sunlight. We're not outside that much. And so taking a vitamin D supplement uh, in the winter uh, to keep those vitamin D stores up at a thousand uh, international units a day, I think is very reasonable. There's some evidence and then some evidence it helps, some evidence it doesn't help with COVID-19 mm -hmm. as a prevention. So it is one of our benign vitamins, I think. Not all vitamins taken um, can be benign. Um, so some vitamins taken in too much can cause harm. Um, this one is very yeah. safe. And so taking 1,000 or 2,000 or even up to 5,000 international units of vitamin D is perfectly safe and it might help. Yeah, absolutely. If it doesn't hurt, why not take it? I agree. Uh, the other thing is, what are your thoughts about Lux lamps? So um, for during seasonal affective disorder, there's as part of uh, treatment, it's been said that having 30 minutes a day of 10,000 Lux of light is helpful. So tell me about ways that people can get that kind of light to help with their mood. Well, as we talked about before, um, we both um, work with vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. And so the lights that people buy are often not affordable for most mm -hmm. of us. So opening up your windows, making sure you don't have the curtains closed. If you work at home, um, open up those windows, put your desk near the windows. If your kids are at school at home, put their workstation um, near uh, the windows. Look for those uh, windows that face east so you get that morning sunshine, mm -hmm. um, depending on which way um, your house or your apartment, your living place um, is situated, and maximize the amount of light. Even though we're going into the winter months, we live in Michigan. We're hardy people. We <laughs> have boots. We have winter coats um, and hats. And even just going outside, if we have a peak of sunlight and taking a few uh, deep breaths of that cold, crisp air, um, as long as your medical provider says that, that that doesn't put you at risk, but a couple minutes on the not so cold days and taking a little walk, um, whether it be walking the dog, walking to a mailbox and back, um, I think can really help. Yeah, I love that you said that. So it's funny, just the last week or so, it had been 
a lot colder than it usually has, and I haven't been outside as much as I'd like to be. And I noticed my mood changing incredibly, and I was, and I didn't even realize what was causing it. I was like, what is the issue? Why am I in, in this mood? And I'm like, it's all these Zoom meetings and blah, blah, blah. Whatever. Anyways, um, it was a nice day. I think it was like 50 degrees outside. And I said, oh, I'm jumping on my bike. I'm going outside. And I went bike riding and I just felt that sun against my face. And it was just so healing. Um, And then from that point onwards, it wasn't 50 anymore. But I told myself, I'm going to spend some time outside every day, um, whether it's 10 minutes or 20 minutes um, and just dress appropriately. And that kind of leads me into the next topic of of dealing with um, anxiety and depression and seasonal affective disorder and even grief is nature. Um, How is nature therapeutic? And what are some ways that people can engage with nature as the season is changing? Well, there are a lot of studies that show that it, being outside in nature um, improves your mood and increases your sense of well-being. And mm-hmm. so spending 10, 20, 30 minutes outside uh, most days of the week can definitely uh, be a therapy for whether it's anxiety and depression, but um, more specifically, even seasonal affective disorder. Um, I, going outside and simply taking a walk, standing outside and taking some deep breaths, um, doing some movement um, exercises outside, doing it safely, not when, we're not talking about when it's icy outside and there's risk of of spilling, but um, just putting a chair out in your your driveway or um, using an app um, for some guided meditation, but doing it outside Mm -hmm. um, can help that sense of well-being. And I think there are a lot of kids at home, so if you have kids at home and not at school, you can do it as a little educational thing. Find some leaves on the ground. Mm-hmm. Talk about the kind of trees or plants or what happens. So bring your kids outside too and, um, and engage them in a discussion uh, about um, what's happening to the trees. Look how beautiful they are right now as they change in colors. That's, that's a great idea. And so recently I've been giving my patients nature prescriptions. And so what that is is basically, uh, so there is um, a website called Park RX. And you can download the app on your phone or look on the website. And it basically is, if you put your zip code in, it tells you all the the parks in your area. Um, And so I I tell my patients, you should spend at least 15 to 20 minutes um, in some some type of park area. So I have a specific park that I use, it's actually called Detroit A Bloom. It's actually a garden um, on the east side of Detroit that's near where my clinic is located. Um, And there, um, you know, patients can participate in gardening, which is really helpful for elderly patients who maybe no longer have a backyard or live in assisted living and they enjoy gardening but can't maintain a garden themselves. Um, so I'll have them you know, spend some time there and engage with uh, the owner. Uh, Tom Milano is the owner there uh, and do some of that or just even spend time. There's a gazebo in there. There's a butterfly garden in there. And so that was something that was being done avidly over the summer months and even going into the fall. Um, but I've continued the Nature RX um, prescriptions because I think that there are beautiful spaces in and around us that we may not know about. Um, just going on Google Maps and looking for the areas that are near water or in some kind of green space can really provide the endorphin boost that many of us need. Um, that's a great idea. I'm going to download that app. Yeah, I'm no. going to start using that for my patients because that's a great idea. Yeah. And the thing is, is like even I, I, I mean, I like being in the outdoors and I feel like using this app or just looking at all the par- different parks that I haven't been to yet in Michigan has been very helpful. Um, and this is, you know, for people who don't live in Michigan, this is a, nat- it's a national um, like park registry, basically. So that that's one thing that I think is helpful. But Also, since the winter months are coming and some people really can't tolerate the cold, the other thing I provide is what I call um, Art Rx, which is doing um, art prescriptions. And we've partnered with a local um, museum. So here it's the Detroit Institute of Arts, but this exists in many other cities, uh, particularly in Montreal and Canada. They have a robust Art Rx program where people can either, if the museum is open, depending on what's going on with COVID, you can actually go to the museum, socially distance wearing your mask, and participate in viewing the art or actually doing drawing in the gallery. Um, And since COVID started with our particular museum, they're doing um, classes online. So you can Mm -hmm. actually learn about the different art. So it's almost like going to the museum. Um, There's also a lot of these virtual um, traveling experiences that you can do. So you can pick 
you know, three or four friends and you all can go on an um, African safari together. Um, you can go to museums in Rome. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, we can't travel right now. We can't go to so many places, but we can utilize the virtual spaces that are available. You can also do things with friends or show um, your own artwork. You know, you can get the coloring mm -hmm. books and they have the adult coloring books and then you can have your own little art gallery and show each other, yeah. you know, what you've done. Um, there are crafts out there because I'm a big crafter. Uh -huh. um, and so it's not hard to knit or crochet and it's inexpensive and you can make hats and socks and, you know, if you have too many, you give them away. And, yeah, you can um, donate them to the homeless shelter. Exactly. Okay. That's, well, that's what I was, <laughs> I was thinking as well. And so I've encouraged some of my patients to do those sort of things because it also makes you feel good. Yeah. You know, make blankets for um, the neonatal intensive care unit or, or, or gloves or hats for the homeless shelter. And um, it's not very expensive. Um, so, so, yeah, so that sort of leads me to the next part of like thinking about ways to um, keep yourself uplifted during this COVID-19 pandemic in the winter. And as you mentioned, working for a cause. Those are some ideas. Um, so what, what are your thoughts, Dr. Weaver, about the temptation to travel during the holidays as they're coming up? So we mentioned that this is a temporary. Mm -hmm. I know that everyone wants to be with their family on Thanksgiving or um, over the rest of the winter holidays. And I think that if we think about that, it's we're talking about one holiday. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful and protect ourselves and not only protect ourselves, but protect those that we're going to visit who are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And if we can stay at home um, and connect virtually, um, someone told me an idea where they're going to send out the recipes. They're all going to make the same thing. Uh -huh. And then they're going to have it by Zoom or FaceTime, whatever. And they'll all be eating the same things at the same time. So it is like they're there together, even if they're not there together. Uh -huh. um, because we should socially distance. People in a warmer climate may have um, an advantage. You can eat outside. Right. Well, we probably can't. And most of us don't have enough uh, space in our homes to be six feet apart. And, uh, and maybe that's still not safe. Um, uh, for people that we don't uh, we don't see on a, on a regular basis, who aren't sort of in our group or our pod, where we all know that they're they're negative, they're not in our household. So if people can understand that it's uh, it's a temporary and one holiday that we're missing, I think um, one holiday season. Yeah. So I liked how you mentioned the pod, your quarantine yeah. pods, the people that you see regularly, maybe in your household or people that during this time that you've kind of entered in your circle of, you know, COVID trust, I guess. Um, and I think maximizing the time with those people is really important as well. So it's like if you have, like you said, maybe it is a neighbor or um, someone, if it's your kids in your house, really just trying to engage with them more can help with some of that social isolation. Uh, let's quickly talk about some other natural things that could be done to sort of alleviate some of the pressures of anxiety and depression. And, you know, I keep saying anxiety and depression, but again, we kind of talked about what that really is. And it's like those feelings of fatigue and sleeplessness and change in appetite and weight gain, you know, being agitated, like all of those things you might consider, like, why do I feel this way? And many of us are in denial that it could be a depression or it could be feelings of anxiety. So let's talk about that. So what are some things that are within our power? So we already talked kind of about social gatherings. Um, we talked a little bit about exposing ourselves to more light, um, nature. What else can be done? I think exercise is a key. This is a good time since there's so much we focus on that we can't do. This mm -hmm. is a good time to focus on what we can do. So we can do good things for ourselves. So we can start an exercise program. We can start to eat healthier. We can start to cut out um, some of the, um, maybe the indulgences that we had initially. Yeah. Um, we can get groceries delivered or we can go pick them up for free or we can go to the grocery store safely. And um, exercise uh, can be done in so many ways now. Yeah. It can be through just movement. Um, there are resources in on apps like Headspace that are free right now uh, that will go through movement and meditation um, 
uh, guided meditation. There are, and, and we talk about, yes, it's virtual, so yes, there's more screen time, but if you're also moving, there are uh, free yoga classes and exercise oh, classes yeah. that you can do um, either on your phone or on, on the TV so that you start to just move and move safely to whatever your level is. And exercise, 30 minutes, you know, three times a week, um, four to five times a week, um, can really help your overall mood. And it gets those endorphins going, as you said. Yeah, it's, um, I started doing these YouTube hit exercises. So they're, they're, it's like 20 minutes long, so there's two of them that I alternate. One's like, like a 10 minute one that I do when I'm tired. Um, and the other one just is really with like you know, five pound and 10 pound weights. So they're just home weights. And initially I thought, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I don't have my gym. I don't have the dumbbells. I don't have the equipment. Um, but I find it a lot more convenient to do at home. Um, and I usually feel better after I do it. And I, I don't know if I told you that I have this um, organization called Dance Medicine um, with medical students and residents, and we teach dance to underserved um, oh. populations and populations of need, people that can't afford exercise. So it's people who love dancing. The reason I bring it up is that we were doing this um, before COVID at um, the Lake House Cancer Center and a couple of other community centers, and we sort of stopped. And then we started up again um, just last month doing it in the gardens. Well, now it's getting cold. And so um, I have three or four medical students that are starting to do dance classes online for free. So it's That's like there's great. so many things that we can we can actually save a lot of money during this pandemic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, by doing some of these things. So we talked about exercise. What about sleep? Um, you know, having a you talked about exercise and having an adequate diet with fruits and vegetables, low carbs. Um, but let's talk briefly about sleep. Well, Exercise does help promote better sleeping habits, so I think that's key. Um, I think eating healthier, um, not eating heavy meals at night will help you sleep. Sleep is important. It's a, an important time to regenerate your body, and when you're anxious or nervous um, or depressed, sometimes you won't sleep at all, and sometimes you might sleep too much. And so trying those natural things, um, avoiding caffeine, avoiding alcohol, which sometimes um, we can't sleep, so we think, oh, well, we'll have something to drink, and that's just not the healthiest way to, to do it in terms of promoting sleep. Um, so avoiding alcohol, avoiding caffeine, um, trying not to eat too much too late will all help promote sleep. Yep, I and think, screen time before bed, I think. Yeah, avoiding screen time. And then there's melatonin. Um, you talked about melatonin before, um, that we don't have as much, um, we don't get as much, we don't have as much in terms of uh, seasonal affective disorder and, and why uh, that is more prevalent in the winter. And so adding melatonin um, at night, doing some meditation before night uh, can also help promote sleep. Yeah, so I think if in general, if you're feeling down um, because of so many different things, I mean, there's the lack of routine, there's job loss, like the political climate, there's so many stressors going on due to COVID-19 and this, just in general with the winter coming, I would say, and you can chime in, uh, Dr. Weaver, I would say, make sure you get adequate amount of sleep, check in with these things first, kind of like your own vital signs. Am I sleeping enough about eight hours a day? Um, if you can improve that, then try that first. That might improve your mood. Um, having a proper diet and exercise uh, is important and making sure that's regular and not just a rare occasion. Uh, being able to socialize with others and finding ways to hang out with your quarantine buddies. Um, and then self-care. Um, we talked not too much about self-care, but it's sort of like doing the things that bring you joy more. So if you had mentioned that you're a crafty person and you like doing crafts. Maybe you're a person that likes to do home improvements, you like music, like whatever it is that's your hobby that you've kind of thrown away in the closet because it's just you don't have the time or you're too stressed out. Being able to bring those th those pieces back out into your life, I think, is um, helpful. Uh, Dr. Weaver, when things get a little bit more serious, let's say you, you really are feeling down, when, does, when is it time to see your doctor? I think if you are feeling more down and it is interfering with your ability to do the necessary functions that you have to do, whether it's to go to, go to work, take care of yourself. Um, you know, you just mentioned if, if you do your checklist and you're not taking a shower, you're not 
um, eating properly, you're not sleeping properly, you're not able to, to go to work or take care of your kids or um, have those social interactions. All of those things you mentioned, if you, not only are you feeling down or anxious, but you're not at being, being able to attend to those uh, things that you should in your own personal vital signs, um, as you said, then I think it's time to either reach out um, to um, a lifeline or call your doctor. Yeah, and also I think seeing a therapist is, is really important as well, and your physician would probably recommend that. Um, but seeing a therapist is something that sometimes people see as a weakness, and I think it absolutely is not. Like seeing a therapist can be so helpful because especially during these times, um, we're all dealing with something. We're all struggling with something. There's not one person I know that's cruising through COVID-19. Um, and therapy can really help. And right now, there's so many ways that you can do therapy right. that's convenient, right? You can do it on your phone. You can do virtual visits. You can go in person. Um, psychologytoday.com has a resource um, that says find a therapist. So you can put in your zip code and they'll list a list of therapists that are in your area, um, the cost, um, if your insurance covers them, and also um, sort of their background of their expertise. What other resources do you have? And I agree with you with therapy, but in our area, there are some cultures where calling a therapist on your own mm -hmm. is is not accepted. So calling your primary care physician sure. to get that link. But also there's a resource. Um, there's a couple resources. One is you call 211. Okay. Um, and that's a resource that will give you the nearest community mental health service program for you. Um, and then um, for all sorts of resources, there's michigan.gov slash stay well. Okay. And that links you to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It links you to um, therapists. It links you to health, Headspace. So all of those things. You are right that um, talking about it, um, a lot of people don't think that it is going to help or there's a stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of studies that, that say that talking about um, what's going on and just your feelings um, will help with that anxiety and depression. And also there's cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. So it's like therapy that actually helps you um, work on things that are maybe difficult. These are things that um, either a life coach can help you out with or a personal therapist and like you mentioned, family physicians. So if someone has made a decision to go to their physician, there are many options that are available to them. Therapy is one that we talked about that's a great option. But we could also uh, offer medication or discuss uh, whether medication or an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication might be appropriate for someone during this time. And it doesn't mean that we're going to put someone on medication for the rest of their life, which is often a fear of people mm -hmm. um, when they come to see us and we say, well, would you consider medication? We're talking about short term. It might be six months. It might be a year. Um, this is temporary, um, often um, the symptoms of depression and anxiety are temporary. Seasonal affective disorder may come back every season, and that's something that people can address with time, whether they really need medication every winter um, if they end up on medication. But maybe this time medication might help some people because we have COVID and we have seasonal affective disorder. Right, absolutely. Um, is there any last thoughts that you want to share with us, Dr. Weaver? I think that one thing that we didn't mention today mm -hmm. that can help is um, animals. Oh, yeah. And so if you have an animal or can afford to adopt an animal or feel comfortable just even going to an animal shelter uh -huh. and walking a dog or just holding a cat or dog, um, if you know somewhere that has horses, um, that's my thing Mayberry um, Park. with my daughter. <laughs> um, exactly. You can go to Mayberry Park and just and see the animals. Animals can be a great source of comfort in this time when someone is afraid, as long as you know you can afford them, and um, there's a lot of animals out there that, yeah, that need love. Point. My neighbor just got a new dog, and a couple of other people I know have just gotten animals this this COVID season. So yeah, that's great. Do you have an animal? I have two Labradors, and I have a horse. Oh yay! I don't know. Maybe I should get an animal. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not home enough. Well, now I am, but we'll see. <laughs> Anywho, thank you, Dr. Weaver, so much for joining us today. And we'll have to do either a socially distanced coffee outing. Um, I found a great place in Ferndale, by the way, um, <laughs> that does outdoor coffees, and it, it and they're it's sheltered, so um, you won't get wet if it rains. Um, or we'll have to do a wellness staycation sometime soon. 
Sounds great. I'm there. Don't forget, podcast listeners, we have plenty of other podcasts around the same kind of topics. So if you're really struggling, there is a podcast out on anxiety. We have one on seasonal affective disorder. We also have a podcast on depression and suicide, so ways that you can help other people going through it or if you're going through it yourself. And then lastly, we have a podcast called Grief Option B, which is a fantastic resource for people who have recently lost loved ones um, due to the pandemic or just in general. Um, So we hope you take a listen to some of those podcasts. We also want to remind you to send along any questions or suggestions to podcast at beaumont.org. In the future, we will be answering our mailbag. We leave you today with this healthy thought. This pandemic has been rough, and we're all struggling in our own ways. As winter approaches, we're at even higher risk for things like seasonal affective disorder, depression, and anxiety. We learned today some things that could be helpful to protect ourselves, which include things like sleep, proper diet, exercise, self-care, social time, and increased sunlight, among many other things. When you're feeling overwhelmed, it's okay to look for and get help. Don't minimize your symptoms. See your doctor or therapist. We'll get through this winter and this pandemic together. Continue your journey to living a smarter, healthier life. Visit beaumont.org slash podcast to access information and resources related to today's podcast.